Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Jimena del Rio. I'm a researcher from the Consejo Nacional de Investigaciones Científicas y Técnicas from Argentina. I'm a humanist. I'm from like literature and social sciences. And I started some years ago in my country, five years ago, to start researching on, uh, let's say, a field called the digital humanities, the humanidades digitales, something that was um, really new in my country by those moments, 2013. So what I'm bringing here is kind of, first of all, a kind of like, let's say, a global south perspective on the digital humanities as a field in these moments. But it is also something that I would like to debate uh, with you. It's, this is a kind of great opportunity for Eleven's uh, conferences because we're not only humanists talking to humanists, but this is kind of what John Brockman would say, a third culture in which we are people from the sciences, from social sciences, literature, librarians thinking together on what scholarly communication is. So this is really great for exchanging experiences and points of view. And this is mostly what I have experienced working in the digital humanities in the last year. So it's a kind of, I have been there myself too. I know how you feel. So these are more, more questions than answers. But one good thing is that yesterday I was at one of the presentations of Christy Holmes in, in, in this uh, event, and she was speaking about giving credit to researchers in the sciences, and we had like so many things in common between what I was thinking, and she was thinking that that is something interesting and really good and positive. So, one thing about the digital humanities, just in case you are not very familiar with it, digital humanities, uh, on the opposite of the traditional humanities, tend to be or want to be interdisciplinary, transdomain open-ended, but mostly collaborative. The, the different thing in the digital humanities is not the humanist working, writing papers, but also working with, in, a, in a group collaboratively with programmers, with people from other um, domains. So this is one of the, the, the characteristics of the field, being collaborative. And it has been like this since the beginning in the first um, book that mentioned the word digital humanities, in which the field was described like that from 2004. Uh, there was a very interesting chapter on thinking about projects and publications, and the word project is really important in the digital humanities as this space in which the collaborative thing appears. Daniel Pitti was um, suggesting how this was so difficult in the humanities, where authorship is something like really in important, and how the digital humanities were called to document every step that they took while working in a project to give uh, attribution um, to, to the work of all the people working in, in a project. And also <clears throat> the responsibility incorporated to the digital objects that were uh, developed, because that's what digital humanities do, finally develop digital objects. But digital humanities nowadays also aim to be global. That's why I, the title of my presentation was defining the, the, this, this collaboration in the global digital humanities. And this is a quite ambitious uh, goal for a, a discipline. Being global is, is really difficult. Being global is not only speaking different languages or thinking disciplines differently, but in the case of what I'm going to talk about collaboration is also thinking that academias are different, giving credit is different, sometimes also um, giving evaluation, ev evaluating people is, is really different. So that is one of the challenges of the global digital humanities that have never been discussed at all. We always discuss the global digital humanities in terms of diversity, but not in terms on how we give credit, how we evaluate people in different places in the world. And sadly, one of the conversations that haven't even, I may say, started in the digital humanities, it's very, very, like this is happening very slowly, is what about the open in the digital humanities? How can we make a more open digital humanities? Um, this is part of a workshop that we gave in Mexico this year. It was the first time that a conference in the digital humanities was celebrated in a non 
Anglophone country. It was celebrated in Mexico City two or three months ago. <clears throat> and we brought this workshop to it because it was a really important moment to think, oh, okay, how can we work on a more open digital humanities? So digital humanities express themselves through digital objects, mostly websites, scholarly digital edition. This has been like the, the one of the, the places in which digital humanities have mostly expressed themselves. Also research tools, online journals, blogs. The term project is always really important here and I mention it once again because project also aims at not only one person working but different people collaborating and working in just one project. But one important thing about this is that the digital humanities mostly in the global north has been like helped by agencies who have given lots of money to keep these projects going, to keep the, the development of digital tools, um, the preservation of the digital scholarly editions, for instance. And this has uh, made the digital humanities very much interested in working with big corpus, but also developing encoding systems like the TI, this is really interesting because the TI is an encoding system that is completely free and open, everyone can use. But in the opposite, the TI is mostly using proprietary software to encode the digital scholarly edition. So these conversations about what is open in the digital humanities, you know, ha ha haven't really s started. But what we see nowadays is a kind of universe of digital humanities that is really clear and that can be really seen on the web through these sites um, and through these, these projects that have been carried nowadays in which you can find people from the humanities, librarians, programmers, everyone working together in just one project. But what happens in the, sorry, in the Humanidades Digitales side because this things might not be exactly the same. In the Spanish-speaking world, all the, I, the, most of the work has been carried out by the associations nowadays. The Red de Humanidades Digitales in Mexico, uh, Humanidad, Asociación de Humanidades Digitales in Argentina, Humanidades Digitales in Brazil, Humanidades Digitales Cuba in Colombia too. So, even though we have organized um, our conferences, and there are many conferences that have been organized in Latin America, we have our own journals. Now we're running the journal of the La Revista de Humanidades Digitales, that is the first journal for the digital humanities in Spanish. The field is emerging very slowly. We just have some projects that can be completely done in, for instance, in Latin America, what has been like mostly the, um, the, what has been happening until now is that most of us have collaborated in different projects. Collaboration has been part of this growing digital humanities and humanidades digitales. A lot of researchers from the global south have been like actively collaborating in many projects from the north, from Spain, from the states, from Europe. But this is something tricky because what happens when we are mapping projects into digital humanities, what we can see is that all the maps that have been done until now leave the global south almost empty. And it's not that there are not digital humanists in the south or we're not doing projects in digital humanities. The point is that we are never mapping collaboration. We're always mapping the projects with the principal investigators from the places, the universities. So this collaboration is never seen, it's, it's invisible. Collaboration is very invisible in, in the digital humanities. And that's um, what I wanted to to, to show in this presentation. Um, how has collaboration been like carried out in, the, in these last years? Mostly through crowdsourcing uh, practices, this open crowdsourcing, maybe editions carried out in libraries. Team collaboration, 
maybe a principal investigator who joins with other researchers, but also there's students and students help in the, in the development of the project. Sometimes they are given some credits, sometimes they are paid for working on their sometimes files, doing some XML, working on the database, cleaning files. And there is also this kind of open collaboration in which this mostly happens in conferences in which many researchers are invited to become part of some projects and collaborate with those projects. Just to mention some uh, crowdsourcing projects, Transcribe Bentham has been one of the first ones in the digital humanities. Um, there has been some uh, this kind of team uh, work in, in other projects um, and other other um, projects also work with like this open methods that comes from Daria in which editors, students, um, researchers I invite to to work for the project to edit to to find materials for the project but they do not appear anywhere as editors. They are just doing some, some work behind the scenes of the project. This, um, this thing about collaboration was clearly seen by TTH Common some years ago when they started this kind of hub in which you could upload the details of your project and seek for collaborations there. But my question is who gets the credits there? Who, who is recognized working in this in these projects? If we pay attention to um, what uh, to examples of evaluation, promotion, and tenure practice in the digital humanities, we have some literature about that. MLA has said something, although it has said something about tenure for researchers, for professors inside academia. This is the same for some other initiatives like the Center for Digital Humanities in Nebraska. Also, we have other voices talking about, like Laura Mandel, uh, about promotion and tenure in digital scholarship. But once again, these voices have focused on how professors should be given credit for the work in these projects, but we're talking about the researcher, the professor, not the rest of the people working in the in the projects. Just to give you an example, and not to be like and and, and to talk about like this, re maybe relationships between one country and other. I will give you an example of what happened to a lot of researchers working in Latin America with Spanish projects, projects from Spain. If we compare, we're all Spanish-speaking countries, but Spain has been part of more European initiatives, has developed uh, until now bigger digital humanities projects or projects in which this kind of uh, um, big project uh, text editing strategy has been developed. One was the uh, Corpus uh, de la Lengua Española from the um, Academy of the Spanish uh, Language in which Many researchers from Latin America edited what's inside the Corde, but they are credited anywhere in, in the website. And this happens with younger projects like the complete editions from Lope de Vega, that is a very important writer from Spain, in which if you go to the website, you will only see the principal investigators listed as the ones working in the project when lots, lots of other collaborators have been there editing the um, files from, uh, from this author. And I might not say that associations have been silent about this. HDH, that is the Association from Spain for the Digital Humanities, also prepare a kind of document about evaluation in digital humanities, but mostly copying what MLA, Nebraska, or Mandel had done until now. So nothing new was said. It was just a kind of translation from English to Spanish. And I might say the same about the Red de Humanidades Digitales in Mexico, in which they developed a kind of form for evaluating projects in which you can evaluate the whole project but not collaborators and how to credit these collaborators. And just to give you a taste of this, I, I carried out a survey some months ago in which I was asking the people that if they had participated in different projects, 
Most of Latin American people had participated in European projects, but not on the opposite. So lots of researchers from um, from Latin America were working for DH projects, mostly in Europe, mostly Spain, I must, must say. That's why I chose these examples. So I think that collaboration in DH also must reflect on what attribution, recognition, credit, and evaluation is, but for everyone, not for principal investigator or for researchers, but also for the researchers who work collaborating in projects, for programmers, for the librarians, for students. Um, I don't recall any initiative, in the, and this is really something that is characteristic of the field that the digital humanities in Europe does one thing, in America, in Latin America, we don't have a a clear roadmap for the global digital humanities. I can only recall a very interesting project that is called Open Medieval French, carried out by David Ristley from Abu Dhabi. With him, I, I have worked with him many times, and and we were thinking on how to give credit to the people who collaborated in digital humanities project much better. Uh, than what has been done in the in, in the field up to now. And we were thinking that not only maps were important, maps of collaboration, but also in having open documentation for the digital humanities, working on a more open documentation. Uh, open documentation in which you could find these researchers, but also collaborators, maybe in, in the websites, but also as digital humanists, we work a lot with data, with metadata. Our metadata should give account of our collaborators. They should be there in, in, our, in our metadata. Um, we were thinking on how to make use of ORC IDs in, in for, for giving credit to our students. This hasn't been done, and it's quite, it, it calls, really calls my attention that the field hasn't paid my, paid my attention to this. And also, I was thinking these days that I have been listening to all of you on how credit has also created this taxonomy that could be used for the humanities too. This could like help us like work on a kind of more open digital humanities in which credit could give, be given to everyone and also would help the evaluation of the people working on digital humanities project. Um, I think that one of the places to start is in, in reflecting on um, not only of a more collaborative or global digital humanities but on a more open digital humanities. I think that if we start a reflection there, it would be better for us to then move to um, see who are working in the projects, who are collaborating in these projects, and to give credit and recognition to all this work. And I would like now to debate a little bit with you and to know your opinions. So thank you very much. If you have some questions, please, if you can use the microphone. Thank you. the taxonomy mm -hmm. um, so I'm doing a PhD on contribution and authorship uh -huh. in science a very interesting taxonomy that is developed by a German group is called Tadira yeah that stands for taxonomy of digital research activities in the humanities yeah I, was wondering I, whether I, tr I did the translation to Spanish of the Tadira okay <laughs> you're saying you know vocabulary server um, <laughs> Tema tres, that is a, a, te a, a software for creating taxonomies okay. we translated it and has that been useful in terms of no Tadira is really useful it's not it's not useful for this Tadira is useful as a taxonomy in which you can say okay digital humanities does this uh, modeling, editing, uh, publishing. So you have activities, you have digital objects, but there is like no, the agents, the, the people who are there are not very much described by the taxonomy. That's but the why I was tasks that are involved in humanities are involved and that's pretty much also what credit mm -hmm. does, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yes, yes, what we have there are activities in the, mostly activities in the digital humanities, in the taxonomy. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, you, you introduced this talk as global, 
uh, and, and there's this lot of discussion about globalization and so on, but there's another term which is supraterritorial. Mm -hmm. where, where you're trying to look at a high level, what, it, what are the elements that are similar, that are, are uh, from a human perspective. Um, and, and I wonder, uh, you know, a lot of discussion here has been about attribution of commitments, of final products, but um, is there a way of, of monitoring contributions on a, on a more uh, granular level, I guess, you know, to, to, mm -hmm. to have that as part of, of your, um, uh, your ORCID ID or whatever, you know, linked to uh, to some identity and it's curated and uh, that you were there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that that would, you know, digital humanities is also about like processes. Sometimes what happens in the humanities on the opposite of sciences is that we don't come with a clear deliverable or uh, what we're doing. We might start with a kind of hypothesis, but then it moves. Uh, sometimes it's, it's for, for the humanities that is something that it happens. So I think that also the like paying attention to this, the people who are participating in these different processes, that, that is, is also really important. I, what I started reflecting, what we started doing with this group of the Open in the Age is just at least to make these problems visible and to see how we could start contributing to, to the field by like helping people being more visible in, in, in the tasks as they are sometimes performing inside projects. But I think that this, not only thinking of deliverables or results, but also thinking about people in the in different stages or processes is, is, is really important too. And I like the term super territorial. I, I hadn't thought of that. I, I'm going to, to look about that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, so thank you very much.